thank you, Pat, for the introduction and um, to the system, to systems for inviting me to talk, as well as a big thank you to my uh, PhD advisors, Courtney Harris and Marjorie Friedrichs at BIM, as well as our collaborators for this project, Katya Fennell, uh, Kevin Shu, and Christophe Rabouillet. The focus of this talk and my dissertation has been on coupling sediment transport processes, specifically resuspension, with biogeochemical dynamics. And for this talk, I'll be focusing on oxygen dynamics. Oxygen is a critical component of marine ecosystems. And um, so the recent, in recent decades, the development of low oxygen areas in coastal environments has been met with uh, a lot of resources being put into trying to limit the extent of these coastal um, hypoxic areas. And so here you're looking at a, um, an example from an online news article that showed uh, that plotted oxygen concentrations for the news, or they're from Nancy Rabelais' work from LUMCON. Um, and so these red areas are these low oxygen or hypoxic areas offshore of coastal Louisiana and the Mississippi Delta. What's important for this talk is that these low oxygen areas develop near the seabed, where sediment transport processes and resuspension can affect the biogeochemistry of the water. So as an example, resuspension can affect the um, vertical profiles of oxygen and nutrients in the water column, which can affect their fluxes into and out of the seabed. And I'll come back to this idea later. Additionally, it, but resuspension just by definition entrains organic matter as well as sediment into the water column. And the decomposition of this organic matter or remineralization of this organic matter can, can consume oxygen. And then finally, um, once the uh, organic matter is entrained into the water column, it can be transported around the system by currents. And so this can cause spatial and temporal variability in oxygen dynamics. As an example here, you're looking at observations from the Gironde Estuary in France. You're looking at a scatter plot of oxygen concentrations on the y-axis and suspended particulate matter concentrations on the x-axis. And what you can see is that when you have these higher concentrations of suspended particulate matter, you're getting a depletion of oxygen at this location in the estuary. And um, the authors attribute part of this depletion to the suspension and transport of organic matter and the associated decomposition of that organic matter um, in the water column. However, using point observations, um, which are limited due to cost and technology constraints, it can be hard to pull apart the relative roles of physical processes like resuspension um, fr from the role of biogeochemical processes like decomposition. And so this motivates the development of a numerical modeling approach that can account for some of these processes. And previous modeling efforts have focused on uh, hydrodynamic, coupling hydrodynamic models with sediment transport models. Here's an example. I'm showing Rob Hetland's model from the Gulf of Mexico, as well as Kevin Shu's model from the same location. And the previous efforts have also focused on hydrodynamic models being coupled to water column biogeochemistry models. And both of these types of models are well represented in the literature. Um, for these, um, wa and, um, these water column biogeochemistry <laughs> models, although I'm showing a picture of chlorophyll here for the Gulf of Mexico, they also are used to predict and um, analyze oxygen dynamics. However, and when they do incorporate seabed or sediment transport processes, they typically do so as a bottom boundary condition for the model, so um, at the seabed water interface. And they're typically based on um, relatively simple parameterizations. And this can affect the model results. For example, in the Gulf of Mexico, this can affect your estimates of hypoxic area by up to 100%. Um, and other environments have also been to, uh, shown to be affected by how you parameterize these seabed um, by geochemical processes at that seabed water interface. And so this uncertainty further motivates the development of a model that can account for both sediment transport processes like resuspension as well as biogeochemical processes. Now for my um, dissertation, we started with a hydrodynamic model that's ROMS, or the Regional Ocean Modeling System, which is well used within the research community. It's open source and community developed. And which is, it's previously been coupled to the CSTMS, 
sediment transport model, um, which is also well used, as well as water column by geochemistry <laughs> models, including the fennel model. The, um, for this work, in order to couple the biogeochemical and sediment transport processes, we did this by adding a seabed biogeochemistry component based on the so Sodert biogeochemistry model. And this allowed us to account for processes including not only the deposition of organic matter to the seabed, but also the storage of organic matter in the seabed and subsequent erosion back into the water column, depending on the hydrodynamic conditions of the environment. Additionally, once this organic matter could be, is, was re-entrained into the water column, it could be transported around the system based on the current. Additionally, by accounting, um, by explicitly modeling the vertical profiles of oxygen and nutrients throughout the water column as well as the seabed, we could account for um, seabed of fl or fluxes of oxygen through the um, seabed water interface in a more process-based approach. And additionally, by incorporating the Soder seabed biogeochemistry module, we could account for the um, this decomposition of organic matter in the seabed as well as other biogeochemical reactions. And if you're interested in more about the model, this was just published in Biogeosciences um, this year. Okay, so for the remainder of the talk, I'm gonna give you two examples of uh, model implementations. Uh, the first example, it focuses on a location offshore of the, um, the Rhone Delta in France. And so here the Rhone River flows through France into the Gulf of Lyons and the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and specifically, we chose this particular location because of this fantastic observational data set. Um, Submillimeter scale observations are really great data set. Um, and we, we were, for this, um, we were, um, the observations came from Christophe Fabier's group at CNRS in France. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second. But it's, um, so for this site, we implemented a one-dimensional vertical model to um, represent their study location. Um, I'm going to show you a movie of the model results so you can get a feeling of how the model works. And so, oops, sorry. Um, okay. And so here what I'm going to show you is you're looking at three um, profiles of seabed organic matter on the left, um, nitrogen concentrations in the middle, and oxygen concentrations on the right-hand side. And... Uh, um, in all three profiles, this black dashed line at the surface at, um, indicates the seabed water interface. And so you'll see it move up and down in response to cycles of erosion and deposition. And then finally, on this bottom panel, you're looking at a time series of bed stress. And so you specifically want to note these three periods of large wave-induced bed stresses that will resuspend one to two centimeters of um, sediment and organic matter. And so... And so again, as we go through these periods of erosion and deposition, you'll, you can see the profiles translate up and down. Um, and you can also see some um, changes in the, bio, the shape of the biogeochemical profiles themselves. Um, however, what you're going to notice for oxygen is that it's really hard to see um, these changes, especially because they're small on small spatial scales compared to the um, cycles of erosion and deposition. And so to look at these a bit closer, um, and so this led us to the question, one, um, can we represent these gradients in oxygen and the changes in the profiles, but also, two, what does that mean for oxygen dynamics? And so here, to answer the first question, is we plotted the model estimates of oxygen concentration in blue, and then these really fine scale, submillimeter scale observations in red. And here I'm plotting the results for two time periods, for um, a quiescent period, and then comparing that to a, an erosional period. And what you're going to notice is that the, um, in both cases, the oxygen concentrations decrease as you go from the water column into the seabed. And then, however, there's, um, when you compared to the quiescent period, the erosional time period has a sharper gradient of oxygen at the seabed water interface. And so this occurs because if, um, here is a little schematic showing um, before erosion, you have an oxic water column which is on top of a, this thin oxic layer of the seabed, which overlies the anoxic portion of the seabed. And so when you have a resuspension event, you're entraining that oxic and suboxic um, seabed into the water column, which results in the anoxic portion of the seabed being much closer to the oxic water column, increasing the diffusive gradient into the seabed. 
And because of this um, change in profile, sorry, you increase the diffusive flux of oxygen into the seabed because there's a higher gradient of oxygen at that interface. And in summary, this matters because it's essentially increasing the sink of oxygen from that bottom water column where we care about the oxygen concentrations. And so um, resuspension is essentially in, is increasing the sink of oxygen from that bottom water column. Now we're going to move from the seabed to back into the water column. And specifically, I'm going to focus on the role of resuspended organic matter and how that affects oxygen dynamics there. And so for this, we implemented the couple or we implemented the model for the northern Gulf of Mexico. So we started with previously um, published um, models from our colleagues, Rob Hetland's group at Texas A&M, um, sediment transport model that had previously been coupled to Rob's model from Kevin Chu at LSU, as well as the um, wa water column biogeochemistry model from Katya Fennell's group um, that had also previously been coupled to Rob's model. And so for this project, we implemented the model coupling, which I talked about earlier, based on parameters from the one-dimensional seabed model from Laurent et al. 2016. Um, and then for the next couple slides, I'll be talking about results from um, transects offshore of Atafalaya um, Bay. So here, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Mississippi um, Delta and the northern Gulf of Mexico, you have the Mississippi River, which flows down um, this, the delta and into the um, Gulf of Mexico. And then you also have a distributary that comes down the Atchafalaya River into Atchafalaya Bay and, um, and enters the Gulf of Mexico there. And so, again, I'm gonna show you a movie so you can get an idea about of the results. So here, what you're looking at is you're looking at transects offshore of Atchafalaya Bay. Oh, time out. Oh, sorry. Okay, one minute. Um, so you're looking at tra transects offshore of um, a Atrafalaya Bay where you're getting high concentrations of organic matter near the seabed. And that correlate, um, or sorry, here you're looking at oxygen concentration, oxygen consumption due to the decomposition of that organic matter. And then on the bottom, you're going to see oxygen concentrations. And um, anywhere where you see these dark red colors, you is indicating where hypoxia or these low oxygen areas are developing. And so what you can see is that you're getting episodically high concentrations due to resuspension of organic matter and oxygen consumption. And this um, somewhat correlates with decreases in oxygen concentration. However, to look at this in a little bit um, without all the variability in the model run, we're, I'm gonna show you um, time average results. And so here what you're looking at is estimates on the left-hand side from the standard model run. And then on the right-hand side, we're comparing the standard model run that included resuspension with a sensitivity test without resuspension. And so the difference in those two model runs gives you an estimate of the change um, in, in this case, organic matter due to resuspension. And so what these profiles are showing you is that you're getting high organic matter concentrations near the seabed. And much of uh, that change is due to resuspension. And then looking at the decomposition rate, in addition to this um, area offshore, um, you're getting high de um, decomposition rates near the seabed where you're getting resuspended organic matter. And then this correlates with a decrease in oxygen consumption in these shallow environments. And so, Finally, um, just to look at this, these results one other way is we're looking at a map of oxygen, uh, or sorry, we're looking at a map of the results instead of a transect, and you can see this similar pattern. So again, the standard model estimates are on the left, and the change due to resuspension is on the right, and in areas where you're getting high organic matter concentrations, much of which is due to resuspension, you're getting higher rates of decomposition and lower rates of oxygen, um, especially lower concentrations of oxygen, especially in these near shore areas um, and downstream of River Mouse where you have a lot of um, organic matter being resuspended. And so in conclusion, we've developed a coupled sediment transport by a geochemical model for coastal marine environments that was implemented for the Rhone Delta as well as the Northern Gulf of Mexico. The, overall, we um, estimated that resuspension increased fluxes of oxygen into the seabed and also increased the consumption of oxygen within that bottom layer of the water column. And then ongoing work includes implementing the model for the Chesapeake Bay 
and looking at the effects of light attenuation in addition to the decomposition of organic matter. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Okay, so uh, moving on, uh, we will have uh, a short break. A short break. Uh, whew. And but I want to go over a couple of things because when you come back, you're not going to come back to this room. Uh, you're going to. Um,